So our sermon text for today comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to read verses 3 through 17. Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll begin reading in verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is God's word. The primary question of all philosophy from the time of Socrates through Plato and Aristotle and on through the present day is this. How do you understand suffering? What sense, if any, can we make of suffering? There is an entire long book of the Bible, Job, devoted solely to this question. Uh, John Piper, a a now retired pastor who's authored dozens of books, I've heard him say on more than one occasion that if it weren't for suffering in his own life, he'd have never written the first word. His entire ministry is trying to wrestle with why is it that people suffer so much? And if you're here this morning and you think that suffering isn't a terribly important subject, that can only mean you just haven't experienced any yet. Because there's nothing more certain. It's going to come. There is nothing more certain than that you're going to either experience pain directly or indirectly by seeing the people around you encounter disappointment and disease and disaster and death. It is coming. And and when you encounter suffering, the natural, the almost reflexive question you ask, I mean, you, you, you just about can't help it. When you go through suffering, you ask the question, why? Why is this happening to me? Why now? Why is it happening to them? Why is it happening to her? Why is it happening to me and not him? Why is it happening to me and not her? Why do we suffer? And the Bible is actually very clear on this, and especially the passage I just read. According to the book of Hebrews, if you have a relationship with your Creator, Through Jesus Christ, the reason, the the ultimate reason for your suffering is clear. It is discipline. C.S. Lewis, very famously, once wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our consciences, and shouts in our pain. Hebrews tells us that Christians should receive suffering as discipline from the hand of God our Father. In fact, verse 4 goes a little beyond that and says, ultimately the reason we experience any of this suffering 
which is the discipline from the Lord, is because of our sins. Now, believe me, I know this is a delicate subject. It is incredibly easy as a pastor to blow it when you're trying to teach a subject like this. Because I can, I can almost see in your faces some of the objections rushing through your head right now. J.D., do you know what happened to my family? You're telling me God let that happen and I should view it as God disciplining me? And you say it's because of my sins? All right, well, J.D., tell me what the sins are. I will stop if I'm suffering because of my sins. J.D., I wouldn't wish what happened to me on my worst enemy, yet you're saying that God allowed this pain because he wanted to discipline me. I know, okay? I know the objections. I know what a difficult subject this is. Just bear with me, okay? Hang in there. And let's first get our, our, our minds around this word discipline, because I think that's where a lot of us can go wrong before we ever get into the subject. The word discipline in the English Standard Version, that's the Bible I, we preach out of at Grace Bible Church, the English Standard Version, that word discipline is used, I think, eight times. I just read it eight times in our text for today. But I don't think that's the best word, the best English word, to translate the underlying Greek word. The underlying Greek word is the word paideia, from which we get our modern word pediatrics or the you know, medical care of children, childhood medicine. And originally, paideia meant the instruction of children. And that meant the oversight of everything in the life of a child, both positive and negative. So the positive nurture of children, the loving nurture of children, and the negative consequences for misbehavior. Positive teaching and negative consequences. Everything a child needs to grow up strong and mature. Now, when we think of the word discipline, though, I think anyway, we almost completely associate it with punishment. You know, we hear phrases like military discipline. And probably not a lot of us think of nurture when you hear of military discipline, affection when you hear of military discipline. And when, we, when you apply the word discipline, at least I think so, when you apply the word discipline to children, I mean, immediately my mind just goes to spanking. Like, it, it's just punishment. But that is not what paideia means. If, if that's the association you have with the word, you're going to misread Hebrews 12. Therefore, I'm going to use the word instruction when talking about paideia in our text for today, because I think it more accurately gets across the meaning of the word. God's instruction certainly includes negative consequences, but it also allows room within that lexical range of the word for nurture and infect, uh, affection. So we're going to talk about God's instruction of his children this morning and do so under three headings. First of all, I want you to see the goodness of God's instruction. Second, I want you to see the point of it. And then third, the attitude we've got to have if we're going to receive it properly. So the goodness of it, the point of it, and the attitude we need for it. First, the goodness of God's instruction. And the author of Hebrews goes out of his way to make it clear that God's instruction, God's paideia, God's discipline, is very, very good. It is beneficial. Let's read verses 7 through 9. It is for discipline or instruction that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have all had earthly fathers who disciplined us or instructed us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? Now, th this whole topic, obviously, is going to resonate with you differently depending on how you grew up, right? If you grew up in an abusive household, you're going to hear something totally different from someone who grew up in a household with a daddy who cared for them, right? We just need to acknowledge that up front. You know, as a father, your, your one job, basically, is to provide for your children and protect them from bad things in the world. And if, as a father, you turn out to be one of those bad things your children need to be protected from, that is a great sin. 
So again, let's just acknowledge up front that some of us are going to have a harder time emotionally getting to where the author of Hebrews is here because of our backgrounds. However, no matter how you grew up, I think everybody ought to recognize, be able to recognize in principle anyway, that there are good parents out there. There are good fathers, good mothers, maybe good grandparents who raised you and did so with love. And if you had someone in your life who cared about you enough to draw lines around dangerous things and tell you if you step over that line, there will be consequences. Okay, not torture, not abuse, but consequences. Well, no matter how you grew up, now as an adult, you appreciate that, right? You see the goodness and the wisdom and the necessity of protecting children from dangerous things in the world, right? Everybody can agree on that in principle. However, as good as that is in and of itself, there is a difference between even the discipline good parents provide and the discipline the, Lord's, the Lord provides because the Lord's instruction, the Lord's training is always perfect. That's verse 10. For they, our fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he, meaning God, and you could insert the word always here because it's certainly implied. He always disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. Okay, so those of us who are parents, we never perfectly train our children, right? If you think you perfectly train your children, I don't know what's wrong with you, okay? Nobody perfectly trains their children. Everybody makes mistakes. We are either too lenient with our kids or we're too strict with our kids, just too willing to say no because it's easier. We are either too, um, uh, our discipline is either too light so that our kids just kind of laugh at us when we say we're going to discipline them or it's too severe. And we never get it right, do we, parents? We never get it perfectly right. And, you know, it is easy as a dad. It's so tempting just to resort to retribution, you know. Your kids do something they wrong, they insult you, they frustrate you, they're disrespectful to you. And what's the temptation? Just pay them back, right? You're not thinking about, you're not thinking about increasing their holiness. You're just thinking about, you made me mad, now I'm going to make you mad, right? If you're around kids as a, a lot as a parent or as a teacher or as a coach, I don't know how you don't occasionally fall into payback. You know, when my kids were younger and we had to do a lot of disciplining around the house, I am sure I fell into payback at least like two times a day for years. That's, that's earthly parents, but God is a perfect parent. Verse 10, he is a perfect parent. Therefore, he brings into the, life of his, the lives of his people just enough unpleasantness to correct them and not one iota more. He brings consequences, sharp unpleasantnesses, but just enough to change us, mature us, grow us, help us on our way to holiness. I mean, after all, verses 5 and 6 of Hebrews 12 quote Proverbs 3 and say, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And one thing you can be absolutely certain of when it comes to God's discipline and instruction is that there is absolutely no element of payback or retribution in it. None. You know, when God instructs his people, there is no anger on his part. There is no frustration. And you ask, how can that be? And the answer is, because Jesus paid it all. You know, it's not that we don't deserve punishment. It's not that we don't deserve payback. Because fundamental to being a Christian, I mean, if you're here in this room and you say, yes, I identify as a Christian, then fundamental to how you understand yourself is that you deserve to be punished. You've sinned. You have deliberately rebelled against God. You have hurt people on purpose. 
You have been jealous. You have been selfish. You have centered your life on yourself instead of God. So we deserve punishment, but we don't get that punishment because the God who has every right to punish us for our sin and rebellion instead became a man in Jesus, Jesus Christ. And about 2,000 years ago, this man named Jesus lived a perfect life in obedience to God's law. Not one jealous thought, not one selfish motivation, not one hurtful action. He never hurt anyone. And then after that life on the cross, he died the death we deserve to die. He bore the punishment we deserve for our sins. Um, Isaiah prophesied about the centuries before Jesus was born. I didn't have to pull this verse out, but it's just such a beautiful one. I like to pull it out so often. Isaiah 53, powerful chapter in the Bible, verses 4 and 5. We read, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Here's what I want you to see as I wrap up this point. As Christians, we have the best of all possible worlds when it comes to our God. Because we have in, we have in our God a God full of justice. He will not let evil and rebellion slide. He, he can't turn a blind eye to evil. He wouldn't be a good God if he did, right? How could you say God is good if he just said, well, we're going to let that murder. We're not going to punish that. We're not going to punish that criminal activity. We're not going to punish that lying. God refuses, he's full of justice, he refused to let evil slide, yet at the same time, he is full of love and mercy for his people because rather than punish them, he became a man and he took that punishment upon himself. He is both just and merciful. Do you see why I say Christians have the best of all possible worlds when it comes to our understanding of God? We have a God who is determined to stamp out sin and everything evil, but he is equally, equally determined to save us, the ones who commit the sin. And that's why Hebrews 12, verse 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So that's the goodness in God's instruction. Now, second. The point of God's instruction. We've already mentioned verse 4. It says, In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And I think it's vitally important to notice here that the author of Hebrews talks about sin, not sins. Now, why do I point that out? If the author had said sins... We might be tempted to think we could find some kind of direct connection between our bad, sinful behavior and the painful discipline, the suffering that God allows into our lives. We might be tempted to think, in other words, that we could, uh, the point of God's instruction was so that we could trace the pain back from our experiences to a particular sin that we committed repent of that sin, and then everything will be fine. Like we could fix it if we just knew what we did wrong. Now sometimes it is possible to trace our pain to our sins. It is possible. You know, if I find myself sitting in the emergency room and my face is bruised and cut and swollen and I'm sitting there on the table saying, why God, why why am I suffering like this? Why are you disciplining me? And then I remember that an hour earlier, I had deliberately insulted a mixed martial arts expert. Then I can say, oh, that's, that's why you're disciplining me. I see, Lord. Thank you for showing me the folly of my sins. Okay, So there are occasions where you can directly trace the consequences, the suffering to the sin. But only rarely. Far more often, you will never be able to see the direct connection between your pain and your individual sins. So you can't say, you know, infl inflation has driven up the cost of groceries, and now it's hard for my family to make ends meet. 
were hurting, God, what did I do? What sin did I commit? You see, that, that doesn't work. You can't say, I have a, rebe a rebellious teenager. Therefore, God is instructing me about some sin in my life because this is really painful. God, show me what it is. Now, probably, yes, you, your actions have played some role in producing a child who is less than perfect. But that situation is far too complex for you to figure out all the details of it on your own. Too many different factors working together. And don't you dare think that if you can just identify and repent certain sins in your life, then everything's going to be okay. That's not how it works. The point of God's instruction is not, okay, look at your suffering, trace it back to the sin, repent of that sin. Now, God does want you to repent of your sins. I'm not saying he doesn't. But if you approach God's instruction with that mindset, it's going to turn you into a fearful, neurotic person. And that's the way a lot of Christians operate. A lot of Christians uh, live in fear that just around the corner, you know, God's ready to smack them. And I've actually heard Christians say things like, you know, I've had a good, and I've thought this myself occasionally, it's been a great month, everything's gone right, something's bound to happen. It's coming. I know it's coming. Do you know how much we dishonor the Lord when we take an attitude like that? God loves us. He is not looking for opportunities to smack us around. Friends, if God were primarily disposed to hate us, we'd know it. We wouldn't wonder, gosh, I wonder how God feels about me. No, we would know it if God was out to get us. God loves us. He sent his son to bear the penalty for our sins so that for all of eternity, the rest of our existence, God could show us nothing but loving, kindness, and goodness. So he's not constantly looking for a chance to bring you to your knees and show you who's in charge. Therefore, back to my original point, it says, in your struggle against sin, not sin. So here's what it means, the point of God's instruction. First of all, we live in a broken world. We live in a world with cancer, with COVID, which I hear is making a comeback, unfortunately, and car accidents. We live in a world where you can lose your job and you can get sick and be hurt by other people. Bad things happen in this world. So we have a broken world, but second, we also have broken souls. It's not this, just the world out there, something's wrong with it. There's something wrong with us, because like I said earlier, we hurt people. We lie. We're selfish. We get jealous. We're, we're focused completely on ourselves to the exclusion of anybody else. We alternate between, between being cowardly and arrogant and kind and cruel. Okay, lots of things are wrong with us, but... The goodness and the point of God's instruction is this. What he's doing is he's bringing, as one pastor put it, the external brokenness of this world into contact with the internal brokenness in all of our hearts to wake us up so that we can see exactly what's going on in our hearts and change. God's discipline, God's instruction means he brings the brokenness of this world into direct contact with the brokenness of our lives in just the right time, in just the right amount, in just the right way so that he can lead us, so he will lead us to him, the giver of all good things, and we can learn how to enjoy all the blessings God gives us without being enslaved to them. That's the point. The point is to get us to trust God completely and totally with everything. You know, to be sure, God wants us to repent of any individual sins we're committing. But the sin underneath every sin, the sin that causes us to commit all the behavioral sins that we do end up committing, is the sin of not giving our lives over to God completely, not trusting him completely. And the point of our instruction is to get us to do that. You know, a Christian's first thought in suffering should not be, 
What happened? What did I do? What do I need to change? God's out to get me. The Christian's first thought in suffering should be something like this. Father, I'm scared. Protect me. Father, I'm hurting. Heal me. Father, I trust you, but it's hard. Give me grace. And the point of all the instruction that God allows to come our way is to get us to say that. That's a struggle against sin, and that's the point of God's instruction. Now, third and finally, the attitude we need for God's instruction. The author closes this section of Hebrews with a, a few warnings, and he's saying, watch out. Watch out for a couple of attitudes that suffering often leads to. They'll destroy you if you allow them to take over your heart. And the first attitude is bitterness. We read about it in verse 15. See to it, he says, that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. It is so easy when you suffer to think, I don't deserve this. Why is this happening to me? I am way better than this other person I know who's out there running around doing all these things. And their life's going grace and you going great. And then you get bitter. And if you're not careful, that bitter attitude can start to control you. You find yourself always dwelling in the past, always mulling over the slights, always thinking about all the things that you didn't get that somebody did. And it and it just starts drilling down deep into your heart. That's why it's called a root of bitterness. If you're not careful, it will drill down to the bottom of your soul and twist you and make you a, suffering can make you a bitter, angry person. And so the author of Hebrews says, watch out. And then the second harmful attitude he says to watch out for is what I'll call hedonism. You know, a hedonist is someone who relentlessly pursues only pleasure. And few things can make you cynical and turn you into a hedonist like suffering. Because this is what you say. Uh, you, you get to the point where you say, okay, life is hard and short, so I'm just going to get mine. I mean, what is the point in trying to live any other way? So you find yourself always focusing on the next fun thing you can do. right? The next party, the next meal, the next drink, the next girl, the next trip, the next game, the next purchase, and, and your life just becomes about that. Whatever is next is going to make me happy. Well, in verses 16 and 17, the author says we must see to it, quote, that no one is sexually immoral. And of course, that's the ultimate sign of hedonism, where you just give yourself to the pursuit of sexual pleasure no matter what. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. Now, we don't have time to go into it, but this is from Genesis chapter 25. Esau was such a self-involved person, such a seeker after pleasure, that he sold his inheritance for a cup of stew because he couldn't wait, you know, an hour to go make himself one of his own. I mean, you talk about someone, a slave to his pleasures, that was Esau. For you know, verse 17, that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he now found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. So a, a hedonistic lifestyle, the dangerous, dangerous part about it, means you can be so preoccupied with chasing pleasure, like Esau, that you can get to the point to where you've so hardened your heart against anything from God that even if you become completely empty and miserable, you find it impossible to repent. Friends, you really can get to the point to where you go down a certain path in your life so far that you can't turn back and live another way. You can get to the point to where you go down a path so far that you can't repent anymore and become a Christian. The book of Hebrews warns about this repeatedly. It's not that God won't accept you. He will accept anyone who comes to him in repentance and faith. The point is, you can go so far down the hedonistic path that even when you're miserable, you can't make yourself 
repent and turn to God. Therefore, instead, the Hebrews writer says, we must become convinced and adopt the attitude. This is the attitude we need for instruction. That it's meant to strengthen us. We've got to receive it with that kind of faith. Okay, whatever this is, God, that's coming to me, I know you mean it to strengthen me. And that's verses 12 and 13. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Have any of you ever had a body part that was knocked out of joint? I never have, thankfully. It sure looks like it hurts when I've seen it happen to other people. What happens when, you're, you know, when you've got a finger or a knee or a shoulder that's dislocated? You're lamed, okay? You cannot use that body part for the function for which it was designed. It's got to be put, it's got to be popped back into place, right? And again, never done it myself, but I hear that's not the most pleasurable experience either. Very painful to have to pop a dislocated joint back into place. Well, we see what the author of Hebrews is saying here. He's saying our souls are out of joint. We love ourselves too much. We love our pleasures too much. We don't love others enough. And we certainly don't factor in God, the giver of all things, anything like we should. And so God gives us instruction, both positive instruction, but also sometimes negative instruction, to heal our souls, to pop our souls back in the joint so that we can live the way he designed us to live and we can walk the path he has marked out for us. That's the attitude we've got to have, knowing that's what God is up to, so that we can receive this instruction. Now, as I, I close, I want to address the people in the room who aren't Christians. And, and in a room this size, there's got to be at least a few of you who don't believe. If you're here this morning, welcome. We're glad you're here. And actually, we, we do plan these services with having unbelieving guests in mind. But I want you to take a few minutes, okay? And everybody can do this, but I especially want those of you who say, yeah, I know I'm not a Christian. I want you to take a few minute, minutes and just think about the suffering in your life, okay? Whatever it is, whatever pain you're going through, will you just take a moment and think about it? And again, if you're just somebody that's so young or so blessed that you can't say that you've had any suffering, then make something up, okay? <laughs> Or think of somebody you love and how they're hurting and think about how that would feel to you, okay? Are you thinking about your suffering? Outside of Christianity, there are really only four explanations in philosophy and the world religions for why we suffer. And if you refuse, if you say, I'm not going to become a Christian, then my challenge to you is this morning, begin the process of picking which one of those four is going to be your explanation for why you suffer? Does that make sense? I want you to think, in other words, and I would love it if some of you came and talked to me afterwards and just tell me what you came up with. It would, on my end anyway, be a great conversation. Four, four explanations for suffering in the world. First of all, there is the atheistic explanation of suffering. Uh, this is the view, as best I can tell, of the educated elite in our country today, in Western Europe today. And this view says that the universe is random and meaningless because the universe came into creation uh, by accident. Therefore, everything and anything in the universe is an accident. So if you suffer, it doesn't really mean anything. You just got a bad draw. There's no purpose behind your suffering. It just is. Atheistic view. Second, there's the karmic understanding of suffering. This is the what goes around comes around understanding. The universe is just wired in such a way so that if you suffer, you're being repaid for something you did in this life or something you did in a previous life. Again, and God's not, a, God's not involved. It's just the way the universe works. Third, there's the Buddhist understanding of suffering. This says that the suffering you go through isn't real because this world isn't real. This world is an illusion. 
And so you just got to teach yourself, kind of program yourself to experience all of your pain as an illusion and kind of get beyond it because that's how you achieve enlightenment. And then the fourth, the fourth way to understand suffering outside of Christianity is what I would call the legalistic understanding of suffering. If you're hurting, it's because you did something wrong and God is smacking you down. If you could just live well enough, you know, if you just had enough faith, if you just, you know, claim the promises enough of whatever your faith is, whether it's Christianity or Islam, you would not suffer. But if you suffer, it's your fault, and you're going to keep getting smacked by God until you straighten things out. Those are the four alternatives to the Christian understanding that suffering is God disciplining his children. My challenge to you is to think, if you're here today and not a Christian, don't just watch YouTube and TikTok. Don't just watch the news and old cowboy movies. Think. Apply yourself to this. Why is it then I'm suffering? Then own it. And then you can have, you know what, if you'll do that, you can have a really good conversation with someone who disagrees with you. And if you're here today and you cannot own one of those four explanations for suffering, then my question to you is, what is keeping you from coming to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? He loves you. He means all things for your good. Romans 8, 28, God is working all things out for the good of his people and those who have been called according to his purposes. He loves you. Your suffering has a divine plan around it. It's guided by a perfect father to instruct and shape and fashion you. There is hope and peace and comfort and real change to be found. What are you going to do with your suffering? Shall we not much more be subject to the father of our spirits and live? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day, and uh, first of all, just for those in the room who are going through any kind of suffering, but certainly heavy suffering, certainly the kinds of things I have never experienced, and I've thanked you many times I have not experienced. Will you comfort them? Will you bless them? Will you please... Make it clear to them that they're not some sermon illustration, but they're real people that, that you love and that this church needs to love as well. Will you please enable them to reach out if they need help so that we can serve them and try our best to comfort them in Jesus' name? But for all of us in this room, I pray that you would teach us, Father, that when pain comes, you're working, and we don't need to run from you. We need to run to you. Father, help us to cry out to you for more grace. Help us to see the Father of our spirits and live. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.